And good afternoon, financial professionals. My name is John Florence, Senior Vice President of Marketing here at E4 Insurance Services, and I'm welcoming you once again to another episode of The Brew, where we build relationships every Wednesday. How about that, instead of every week? Uh, on today's Brew, we welcome Dan Javorsa, who is the Chief Technology Officer Officer at EpiSci. EpiSci is a technology contractor that, among other things, is working on artificial intelligence projects for the Department of Defense. Dan is one of the headline presenters at our upcoming Savvy Advisor Solutions meeting in Fargo next week, and we thought we'd take today's brew to give you a quick preview of his talk. Let me start by saying uh, Dr. Javorsic was until recently a colonel in the United States Air Force, where among other things, he was a fighter pilot, a squadron commander, experimental aircraft test pilot, an artificial intelligence program manager at DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, sort of the research branch of the military, if you will. And if I have this right, prior to his retirement last July, he was the commander and director of the F-35 program at Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. So pretty impressive resume. Uh, to you know that that's sort of the pinnacle of it. If we go back and look into his uh, his educational background, he graduated from Purdue University with a degree in aeronautical engineering, and since then has earned several advanced science and engineering graduate degrees, including a PhD in physics from Purdue. I was astonished to learn uh, in looking into this background that uh, Dan had earned the PhD distinction in a three-year period while largely being self-taught in physics and, and while he was still employed uh, with the military. So as, as impressive as that short bio is, that when you meet Dan in person, he is about as unassuming and down to earth of a person as you will probably ever encounter. So we're happy to have him with us today. So Dan, welcome to The Brew today. We're really looking forward to seeing you next week in person. And just to clarify before we get going, do I call you Doctor, Colonel, Animal, Sir, what is it, Dan? <laughs> well, you've always called me Dan because that's what you. We've known each other for uh, long enough to be, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Whatever works for you, right? I remember being in college and having some professor really want to be called professor, and another one wanting to be called doctor, and I was like, man, these people get really hung up on their on their titles. Um, no, whatever, whatever is comfortable. I will tell you that my physics friends. Uh, struggle with the call sign thing, um, but my call sign is Animal from the Muppets. If you're old enough to remember, I mean, I know you are, John, but like if the <laughs> your your viewers are old enough to remember uh, the Muppets, uh, the crazy drummer guy from that. So uh, it's a long story that is well better told over an adult beverage, um, <laughs> but uh, that's what most people kind of know me as. So, you, but you can call, use whatever term you want. I answer I'm, to hate you. I'm comfortable with Dan, which is how I met you the first time. And I think yeah, uh, it works. Been it works. Talking to each other like that for well over, I hate this to even think about this, but it's been two decades. Yes, really, since we first met. <laughs> um, we could really get into some interesting stories about that, but, uh, you know, our time is short today. Let me just start off by saying this. So two things really happened that kind of brought us together today in this confluence of a meeting and really that, that precipitated us having you uh, come and talk to us uh, next week up in Fargo. And, and the first one was this. At the beginning of the year, uh, right around December, January of this year, many of you will recall that we had just in, been introduced with a tremendous amount of fanfare to something called Chat GPT. <laughs> right, which um, if you don't know what that is, it's a large language model artificial intelligence program that has since launched this national debate on artificial intelligence with all kinds of hand wringing and speculation about the loss of our livelihoods as professionals um, and and maybe even the end of the world as we know it being taken over by our <laughs> overlords. Now, a lot of that, of course, is media hype, and and but but I do want to kind of address a little bit of that as we get into our chat. The second thing is that I was reminded of, Dan, your work when we, uh, in the work that you were doing in artificial intelligence, because of some articles that had appeared in the Wall Street Journal on uh, a thing that you were doing that was called the Alpha Dogfight. Um, 
And I thought it would be interesting to have you on and get a little bit more of a nuanced perspective as somebody who is a true practitioner in this area of what is really happening in artificial intelligence. And what does it have to do with what we deal with in this sort of separate realm entirely of you know, financial planning and insurance planning and, and so forth? So, so let's let's start by this. Dan, let me ask you a question and we'll clear this up a little bit. The term artificial intelligence, right? Yeah. Kind of like the word mammal. <laughs> it's not a monolithic software program, is it? No, or is it no, descriptive no. of different technologies. What are some of those areas and in, in, in what kinds of things have you been developing? Yeah. So um, first off, artificial intelligence is the term that has been uh, branded to a particular subdiscipline within computer science that is around uh, solving problems uh, a little bit more the way that we do as humans than the way that um, that computers traditionally do. In fact, um, there was a bit of a battle in the late uh, or mid 50s on what term they were actually going to use. Um, the the two that were uh, really in contention was artificial intelligence and intelligence augmentation, AI or IA. Now, obviously, we're all having a conversation around AI because that's the branding that that uh, kind of stuck uh, at the end of this. But I would argue that Really, the IA piece, the intelligence augmentation, is what has actually been uh, instantiated in most of the things that we see. So, you know, in one in one of those, the um, artificial intelligence was almost an idea that we are going to completely emulate uh, what humans uh, can do, think, how they behave, all of that sort of stuff. And if you've watched any, um, or if any of the viewers have watched any of the Hollywood films, uh, The Imitation Game, which is uh, about Alan Turing. And, you know, it revolves around the basically the the development of the computer back in World War II to solve, uh, crack some codes that the Germans had was really what laid the foundation for a whole host of a lot of what we see today, both in the computers that we're talking on right now, as well as in uh, a lot of this artificial intelligence. So while most people, um, you know, you're your in-laws will will not have been very familiar with this terminology. It's been around for much longer than you and I have, and it's gone through its phases. Just like any research area, there's it's associated with hype. Um, in fact, there's a lot of hype in the field uh, back in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s. And then um, it turned out that the approaches that they were using um, at the time, uh, while they had a lot of promise, they had a lot of uh, pretty significant limitations that led to what we call the AI winter that kind of persisted from the mid 80s into the 90s. And then you see a resurgence of a lot of this uh, development coming out of computer science um, in the early 2000s and into the 2010s. And it was really the reason why you're seeing another confluence and a resurgence of this and, and actually making its way into the, the public sector is that the, the technology itself um, is finally gotten to a point where the, the computational power is married up with the algorithmic approaches in a way that they're showing tremendous fitness in a whole host of different applications. And, you know, just like any new emerging technology uh, that comes, there are some people who just want to embrace it and blindly accept it. And there are people that are remarkably skeptical and, and feel pretty threatened by uh, precisely that same thing, right? Interesting. So um, I mentioned earlier when I was saying a little bit about your bio that you had done some work with DARPA. And I, I know and understand that, you know, a lot of what you were doing there is classified information. You're not going to just, you know, spill the beans on everything that you were doing there. But can you give us a <laughs> gist of what you were trying to accomplish? And, and you know, what, what were you doing there? Sure. Um, I will say, uh, you know, first off, uh, if, if you're not familiar with uh, DARPA, just like you kind of mentioned, um, the uh, they really are kind of the re the the high risk high reward research arm of DoD. So there are a lot of things in our I would say our everyday lives that we can actually be grateful to that institution for the things that they've done. Think GPS. Think the internet. Think the original internet was ARPANET. You know, it, while I think Al Gore believes that he was a pretty big aspect of of that uh, it turns out it still takes a lot of people <laughs> to invent something like the internet um and there there's no shortage of people with claims to fame to it but if you 
if you start looking at it, those are the sorts of things that at the time, you know, the internet was not, um, or what was called ARPANET was not really a uh, recognized for its potential. And just like a lot of these sorts of things, uh, you need someone who is investing capital into doing these high risk, high reward types of deals. And that's what DARPA does. Now, I will say when I went to DARPA, um, I went there with a chip on my shoulder, like a lot of uh, DARPA program managers. And in my case, it came from, uh, I came with a bunch of scar tissue from, uh, I would say, the 20th century model in which we acquire systems. Um, you know, if you look at uh, any of these large uh, purchases that the government make, ac ac um, acquisitions that the government makes, um, like the airplane that's sitting back here, uh, you find that we have been operating for quite some time under a model that um, that has emphasized hardware development. So, you know, if you take take yourself back to the 1300s um, with you know several of the battles between France and Britain, you know, you'll you'll kind of if you're if you're familiar with this, then the British, for example, introduced the longbow, which was a new weapon. It had an advantage over the others, and it gave them uh, victory. So from those time on to like the printing press, to airplanes, to pretty much every technology, what you found up till the end of the 20th century, every new technology required you to build a new widget out of atoms, <laughs> right? Um, and the problem is, is that you buy and acquire things very differently in this digital world that we are living in right now, right? The one that's influencing our, our daily lives. And what I took to DARPA when I went there, I, I, I got to DARPA in 2018, was we have to frame our new capabilities, not in atoms anymore, but in, in the digital space and in software, right? Because I will tell you, that if you if you take this phone, um, and I don't know how often you refresh the hardware of your phone, but I will tell you that my phone's a couple of years old, and it is more capable now than it was when I bought it. And the reason for that is not because it has new copper in it. It's not because it has new wiring in it. It's because it has new software in it, right? And if I take this phone and I compare it to the phone that hung on the wall in my kitchen with a long, curly cable attached to it, right? That phone got worse every time you ratchet, ratchet, ratchet dialed around that mechanical system. So it was that phone that hung in my parents' kitchen was the best it was ever going to be the day that it came showed up off the assembly line and, and packaged right out of the packaging. And then it deteriorated over time. It got worse at doing its job over time. In software and in the world that we live in now in the 21st century, what characterizes that as unique is that we have hardware that enables us to create a software-defined future that we never imagined possible when we created those sorts of things. So when I went to DARPA, my, my philosophy was, I want to take that same thing to DOD, and I want to build only software programs. So that's pretty much what I did. I built AI programs and battle management command and control programs and ones on sensor tasking and resource management all wrapped around the idea that a third party software developer can come on, use existing hardware and extract a remarkable amount of latent capability out of that system. That is what has disrupted our personal lives. And I think it's in sort, we need it if we're going to compete with, um, you know, peer competitors in, uh, in the defense space as well. So that's what we did. And so, right. so yeah, one of the things that we did was we, we did the AI thing that you were talking about. You're the reason why it costs more to buy an old version of that F-35 airplane than it is <laughs> to buy the new one because of all the new capabilities that have been able to be retrofitted into the uh, reading about no, that. Don't put, don't, put that, don't put that on me. The, <laughs> that's the system. So the system, so that's a great example, though. The airplane, the F-35, which I flew it, it's a nice airplane. There are some elements to it. it just like every airplane, it has its virtues and challenges, but... What, the way that we build and pot airplanes before was in this vertically integrated stack. Like you have to build, you know, Lockheed Martin builds the hardware, they do the integration, they build the software, they do everything. Now, the problem is, is that anyone who is a, a study of the market recognizes that the virtues of a market and capital, capital co economy is with competition. Well, if I award this contract, I can't remember what it was awarded, what, 2000 and one or two, somewhere in there is when the contract was awarded. 
And then for the next 40 years of that airplane, you have a monopoly. Nobody can put software onto that airplane except Lockheed Martin. Well, I'll tell you that for all the great things that Lockheed Martin does, it's not really a software company, right? So it's probably not a huge surprise that when we need new software to come out, it's a problem, right? Because you've eliminated all the competition. Um, if instead you said, hey, I'm going to have Lockheed do what they do well, and that is build the hardware. And now I provide some third-party interfaces and access to the app store and then let anybody come in and build best of breed. We'd be in a very different spot with that airplane. And we'd be in a very different spot uh, on the numbers of airplanes that we could uh, purchase and the sorts of things that we can do with them. And that's what you're seeing the secretary of uh, the Air Force, as well as a bunch of other folks, starting to adopt this language now. But it it has been a long slug to adjust this very slow moving ship that, in all honesty, has been conditioned over centuries that the right answer, the way that I build new capabilities, I build a new widget. And that hardware innovation model was one that um, was phenomenally expensive to play in, except, certainly in the 20th century. And it was in fact so expensive that we outpriced our peer competitor in the Soviet Union, right? They, you know, the wall fell largely because they lost the willpower and the resources to continue to compete. Um, and the problem is, is that that can't persist forever. We can't continue to pay more and more for a new airplane each time. Um, at some point, we have to break that model and transition to what I would say the private sector has largely, and that is recognize the software defined world and recognize the value and adaptability that comes with that. But it comes with challenges and those sorts of things as well. And AI that, plays a big role in all this. That's an interesting point that you bring up. And that's really kind of comes to the gist of, of what we're really talking about here. Because um, one, of the, one of the things that you were doing at DARPA that really got, I think, the world's attention, and, and particularly some of the writers and Wall Street Journal, was this thing that you did called the Alpha Dog Fight, um, mm -hmm. which is my very limited understanding of it was basically pitting real live, you know, trained top gun types of fighter pilots against artificially in, artificial intelligence controlled planes and putting them into you know, combat simulations together. So, so almost like just the comparison of, of, you know, human versus machine, right? Or is there some blend between that? Which one wins out? And I know you can't share the results of that, but can you comment a little bit about that? No, program? we can actually share almost all the results of that, mainly because we did it. I very deliberately, you know, more scar tissue that I took with me to DARPA was all the, the how much we overclassify and layer in classification things for, um, a lot of the wrong reasons, right? So anyway, um, yeah, so the, uh, you know, there is a long narrative that has persisted, again, almost since antiquity, uh, of this man versus machine when new technology comes out, right? If you're familiar with, and I'll talk a little bit about this uh, next week as well, the, the folk story of John Henry, right? Um, for those of you that may not remember, uh, you know, the story behind John Henry is really one of a contest between an American folk hero and the steam drill. And what John Henry, you know, according to the legend, John Henry uh, was a freed slave. He came out of, uh, after the Civil War, he was a freed man and was looking for work. And as like a lot of people um, of his background found themselves in this hard labor associated with helping uh, I think it was the Chesapeake and Oil Railroad, or sorry, Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad, as they dug their way tunnels through the Appalachians, right? Because they didn't want the trains to go all the way up and down, so they were digging holes through the rock. And it turns out that's a lot of pretty hard hard work to do. And the way that they would do it is they would have uh, these guys that are called steel drivers or steel driving men that would basically take um, a steel post and pound it into the rock so that they drill a small hole and then they'd pack that with explosives and then they would put explosives in there. They blow the hole would allow the explosives to have its kinet kinematic effect on a much larger portion of the rock than if you just set the, the explosive on the surface of the rock. Um, but it was a lot, it was very hard work to pound those, those holes into the rock. Um, and one day, you know, I think it was February of, of 1870, a uh, steam drill salesman kind of shows up and he says, Hey, there's this new thing steam it's been powering the locomotives that we're talking about it also can power a whole host of other things and one of those is this steam drill 
And, you know, you would normally think that the, that John Henry and his, his peers would see that as a, a virtue, right? You'd go, oh, well, the steam drill, it is, uh, it's going to solve a lot of my problems, right? Because this is what I've been slaving and sweating over all this time. Instead, they saw it as an affront to their jobs, right? And it's a front to their, the way that they made their living. And as a result of that, they, you know, this, the, the salesman basically says, hey, I'm going to pit a contest, man versus machine or man against machine. And John Henry basically picks up two of these 20 pound hammers and they ready, set, go. And they see who can drill uh, further and deeper into the rock. And at the end of at the end of the day, at, the, at least at the end of the ballad, if you go listen to the folk song, John Henry uh, ends up being victorious. He he pounds 14 feet into the mountain while the steam drill only does nine. I think it's mainly because it allows the phrase to rhyme, right? So who knows what the actual numbers are? Um, but the point is, is that at the end of the day, the human wins, but he dies of exha exhaustion, right? So you know, the moral of the story is that although humans were able to prevail in that one moment with this super strong, strong man who was able to do it, um, he died because of the effort. And there's this thing called the steam, steam drill that is going to do the same thing. And the problem is, not problem, but that arc and that narrative is repeated throughout history, right? All the way up until the present day. And so part of the reason for the, the alpha dogfight trials being man versus machine was to fit in family with that, mainly because it's something that resonates with people, right? Um, pilots in general, um, when when unmanned aerial vehicles or drones kind of came onto the scene in the late 1990s, pilots avoided them like the plague. There are all kinds of funny stories of pilots like doing anything to get out of flying one of these unmanned vehicles. And as a result, the unmanned vehicle community didn't was was not led by the people that actually know how to do that particular work. And what I saw on the wall was AI falling into a very similar category of being relegated to the the fantasies of engineers who have no idea what the actual combat environment is like, and the people who it is designed to repl to help, right, see themselves as being replaced and being fearful. And one thing that one of the best ways to motivate fighter pilots to uh, put skin in the game is to draw first blood. And so that's really what that was. It was to draw a little bit of blood. So the pilots are like, wait, hang on a second. And now once you get them engaged, you say, actually, actually the plan is to not have it replace you and threaten you, right? Threaten your, the, the you know, all the things, the heritage, the honor, the values, the dignity that threatened John Henry. It shouldn't be thought of as that, but rather something that you can partner with. If you if if I kind of go off on a side, one of the things that AI has used as a benchmark, I'd think of it as a an environment for testing out uh, their progress, has been with games. And so that started with like tic tac toe uh, back in the fifties. It progressed to chess in the late nineteen nineties. If you have ever heard of a guy named Gary Kasparov, he went down in history as losing to IBM's Deep Blue in nineteen ninety seven. In fact, he has a great TED talk where he opens it with, hey, I won a lot of games, right? <laughs> like uh, he starts with like, I actually won, but no one seems to remember that part. Um, you know, because he was a a, Nash, a world champion for many, many years, I think 16 or something like that. I, I might have the date, the numbers wrong. But the point is, is that Gary Kasparov fell to um, the computer IBM Deep Blue. Now that wasn't an AI computer. It was a brute force calculate one. And there was a lot of um, predictions that were made in 1997 of whether machines would ever be able to handle that kind of more intuitive nature of other games. And so in 2016, uh, you see uh, the game Wei Qi, which, um, or the game of Go, it's Wei Qi in Chinese. In uh, us, it's, uh, the, or in Korea and Japan, they call it Go. And in fact, if you've ever seen the movie, A Beautiful Mind, it's A Beautiful Mind, and they're playing this game with these stones that are black and white stones on a on a on a board, that's the game that they're playing. And the the reason why Go was so important, or Wei Qi was so important, is that it is uh, it was oftentimes considered. First off, the number you can't brute force calculate your way through it like you can with chess. The number of moves are you know outnumber the the atoms in the observ observable in universe. So you have to have some level of intuition. Um, and it is oftentimes in the top five things of being a gentleman 
uh, in many uh, cultures uh, that play the game, right? So it's widely played and well understood. But the problem is that it is uh, sequential, it's perfect information, and it's a board game. And so when people draw these conclusions from like, oh, this is AI is doing all this grand strategy stuff, you're like, yeah, it's a board game, guys. Like, I get it that it's been around for 2,500 years or whatever, 5,000 years, but it's just a game. It's um, a closed system with limited rules. Um, that's right. It's finite in a beginning and an end. And that doesn't really mimic what's happening in the real world situations with and humans interacting in the real world. That's exactly right. But even with that, the computational horsepower that was needed to solve those problems was one that many people in 1997 predicted wouldn't happen for 100 years, if ever. And then in 2016, uh, DeepMind's AlphaGo, uh, the algorithm or the series, the set of algorithms that are played the game against, you know, the Gary Kasparov of, of Go at the time, Lee Sedol, he's the world champion. Um, he loses uh, the match. Um, same kind of deal. Very similar to Gary Kasparov. If you haven't seen the documentary, if you're even remotely interested in this, Netflix has a free documentary on AlphaGo that is a terrific to watch. And when you do, I encourage you to pay attention to the John Maddens of Go, because yes, they have uh, you know sports-like announcers that are narrating what's going on in it, especially for those of us who don't really play it. You know, I'm an American. We play uh, what poker, not sure. not, uh, not 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 board games. But the point I'm not trying to. The point is, is that it had a very Im big impact um, in Asia because of its uh, role, and it certainly, um, I would say, mobilized a lot of the investment that the PRC, Public People's Republic of China, had in the potential value of this AI. So um, they called their their algorithm Alpha, Alpha Go, and so when we came up with this man versus machine contest. Um, we called it alpha dogfight because we're presenting it with a problem that is not a sequential turn-based board game with perfect information. Instead, you are going to have to dogfight. Now, it's in simulation. That's the way we started it. But it's still the dynamicism, the low latency responses that are necessary to prosecute an attack and defend against an adversary are very different. Um, and that's a bit closer to when we as humans say, hey, this requires, you know, and thanks to Top Gun, we've conditioned pretty much the entire populace to think that that's at the apex of human creativity and intuition, right? The The answer is dogfighting is actually not that tough. Um, and and we don't even call it dogfighting. We call it BFM, basic fighter maneuvers. But uh, but yeah, it's it's what we basically have our brand new guys do the second they learn to take off and land as we go teach them to do that, right? Um, and it's because it's really less about aerial maneuver and close combat because we expect most of that probably won't happen that much in the future and it's more about creating a crucible where we can prune and shape their behavior performance and most importantly trust if i want them to be my wingman right and so when i'm an instructor i take them through all of these paces mainly because i want to make sure that the human that is flying with me into actual combat with actual problems and actual bad guys and actual potential for fratricide and and clear avenue of fire considerations and confusion and denial deception all that sort of stuff is able to handle the the rapid decision making and accurate decision making that is necessary in this uh one v one dogfight right that's that's fascinating you you mentioned one word there that jumps out at me which i think is the perfect bridge over to what does any of this have to do with anything having to do with financial finance advice? yeah and, and that word was trust right that's and right. And part of your thing was overcoming the natural human reticence to trust technology. As you said, it's been a historic thing almost since the beginning of time. Um, and it's even more accelerated now because the time periods to adapt to these technologies are shrinking. And the key element in all of this is trust. As you said, um, the you know, in your fighter pilot world, you know, you had guys who were hesitant to give up their heritage, honor, dignity, and values to technology, like it was somehow stripping them of that humanity. 
And we find the same thing, I think, in the financial community where we see artificial intelligence encroaching upon the things that we believe that we provide value for, which is our ability to construct a portfolio or, you know, to analyze the stock market or to to put together this amazing sequence of, of a detailed plan for a person's retirement, whatever those things are. And we see artificial intelligence as a threat to that. Talk about the trust and what you've learned, um, you know, and how this applies to our to our people who might be listening to this. Yeah, and I think I think that's probably the that is an important takeaway, and I'm glad we finally got to it at the 31 minute point, right? <laughs> <laughs> Instead of just telling stories about flying fighter airplanes, um, the yeah, one one of the things that you find, or at least that that was self almost self evident to me once you kind of get a peek behind the hood of this is that. This applies to anyone with high consequence outcomes of the decisions that they're making, right? If you're if you're in charge of cat pictures on the internet, like no one's going to care about trust and whether you get it wrong or not. Um, in military situations, it's very obvious because they're life and death decisions that are being made, and and you have these high consequences associated with them. So it's kind of easy to kind of translate some of the story that and narrative that we've had before. But the problem is, is that or not problem, the the important takeaway is that this actually applies to far more things than just the military. And in your case, um, and in in financial pieces, this is um, arguably uh, can be as existential of a decision that you need to make on what how you how you make your investment decisions and, and who you rely on to help you help you make those sorts of, you know, where you get that sort of advice. Um, And so, the reason why I say that is that this idea of of changing this from an adversary, like this adversarial approach to uh, the adoption of this new tech technology, which is really this is the John Henry. This is um, you know I have other other stories throughout time that where you see a similar type of thing. This this reticence to adopt the technology is is as if it's an adversary, and instead ally with it is an extremely valuable lesson learned lesson learned and a takeaway if you look at the chess for example a lot of people said after gary kasparov lost in 1997 that no one would play chess and chess would be dead and no one you know doom and gloom uh it's horrible they're taking away this piece and what you found was that first off people certainly still play chess but they play it differently and in fact you see what is called centaur chess um happening where now I can I can partner with a, a computer and the computer can do some of the number crunching and I can do the pieces that I think are strategy based or more intuitive on how to play the game. And in fact, one of the things that you found, in, in fact, it was 2005, I think, 2005 Centaur Chess Tournament, um, the winners of the entire tournament. You would think so. Then the, my naive approach to this would be that it would be the guys with the best computers and the guys with the the best grandmasters. So the a grandmaster paired with a supercomputer is going to win every single tournament, right? And what you found in 2005 was that the guy that won, or guys, it was a team. The team that won were two amateurs and three laptop computers that you can get from Best Buy, right? Um, and you go, how is that possible? And the reason that is possible is because it's not about the absolute power of either of the two teammates. It's how they work together that is the most important. Minimizing friction between those two, knowing how to capitalize on the strengths of each is extremely important in creating the outcome that you actually want, right? And that is the piece that our fighter pilots are now starting to understand They are beginning to embrace the idea that they have these pilot assist features that can help them do their job better and elevate their cognitive performance. I talk oftentimes about a redistribution of cognitive workload in the cockpit that is a revolution that is underway right now because of the introduction of AI. And it is in that partnership, in that teaming piece, that we gain the most value. And that applies well beyond just the military. That applies as a financial advisor. It applies as... um, you know, a lawyer or in any of these. And so a lot of people who are, I would say, initially threatened by this, once they recognize how to to partner with this, how to convert from adversary to ally and convert your tool into a teammate is really where uh, the value proposition lies. Now, I will say, if you are making your money and you your corner market is on 
the raw compute and those sorts of things, those are going to be handed over to uh, the autonomy. So what we find, um, at least on the pilot side, was that the pilots who really fixated on their ability to land, aka Navy guys, um, the uh, the fixate on that are the ones that are going to be the most threatened because that's the piece that we can very easily hand off to autonomy. These narrow focused uh, AI systems are very good at doing those sorts of things. What they are not good at and what they maybe will never be able to do is capture the context and sent intent and sentiment and the ability to understand the nuance and emotions and all of the bad decisions that kind of come from that that I think would translate into uh, a lot of what you guys are uh, dealing with on the financial market side. Yeah, I think the takeaway for me here is, is, look, technology is inevitable. This stuff is coming down the pike and there's nothing that's going to stop it. And it's getting better and better and better. And mm -hmm. rather than be threatened by that, it's, you know, how do you make sure that you're honing your skills to be able to still deliver that value, you know, heritage, honor, dignity, and so forth that you've always provided, but but in a in a distinctly human way. So, you know, could you, as a wrap up, could you just encapsulate that? Like, how, um, you know, what what should an advisor focus on? I mean, is it uh, what what do you what do you build in order to keep your value in the equation? Yeah, I mean, I I think. Uh really, you focus on your humanity, right? I know that sounds uh, goofy and it's easy to I'm kind of very much track into hard military guy. The, the soft skills, but it, it really is, it is that piece, right? Um, when you look at trust and, um, and really when you look at the, when I talk about trust, I'm really talking about that technical definition where it's, it's the extent to which one party is willing to really depend on another in a in a situation with a relative you know feeling of security, even though negative consequences are possible, um, it's relational, it's contextual, and it's subjective, uh, and it includes a willingness to be um, I would say vulnerable that is difficult or if not impossible to write into computer code. Right. And it is those pieces. And and this is also why it's kind of so threatening the chat GPT and a bunch of these natural language processing models that emulate um, kind of human conversation, which is really what you're seeing on a lot of these. Um, why they seem so threatening is they start to breach into some of those elements that uh, older systems have have tended to have. And so that's where, you know, if, if you are if you are advising, I think if you're a financial planner and you're advising another human who is who is, is experiencing emotions because of some change. Like I just retired from the military, right? So we're going through a lot of change. We're buying, a, we've just bought a house. We're moving, moved to a new state. We're doing all of these sorts of things. These are sources of uncertainty. They're also sources of um, concern and uh, uh, fear, uh, grief, if I were to use that word. I think that's maybe one you may have used in the past. These ideas of trying to minimize those bad feelings can drive us to make very different types of decisions, right, than you would maybe do if you were a rational actor in kind of the traditional economic sense. And the point is, is that as a human advisor who has gone through these sorts of things, you can empathize with what that client is doing on a way that no automated system ever will. And that is the value, I think, that you bring in this sorts of situation. The computer can help you calculate all sorts of fantastic parameters, but when it comes down to it, and I say this over and over in life, data are interesting, but it's stories that move people and it's stories that change the world, right? And it, when it comes down to that, the computer will never have that piece. So capturing that the computer is very helpful on the data analytics side, it can be able to find you relationships and, and help maximize aspects of a portfolio in a way that humans never could. But when it comes to that, that the soft aspects of your humanity, that is the piece that I think as an advisor. Now, you know, if I were an if I were a financial advisor and I was really great at the calculating part and I had zero bedside manner, I'd maybe be a little bit worried, right? But for the most of us, in fact, most of us actually like that that human piece of it. And if we could offload just the monotony to this automated system, then it's very, very consistent with the sorts of things that we do for flying airplanes. Like, I hate to break it to you, I hate landing, right? Like the fact that the Navy guys practice landing so dang much just 
is absurd to me because it means every time you got to practice a landing on a ship that's moving around is time you're not learning how to outthink your adversary, which is really what we're there to do. And so if I can build an automated system that helps me take that off my plate, then I get a chance to focus on what is actually interesting and novel and, and new to me. And that is how do I outthink my adversary instead of how do I fight with this technology to make it conform to something that I need it to, to get the job done. That's fantastic. Listen, we I could talk to you all day, and I think you've got all kinds of very interesting stories and anecdotes to share here. We're going to need to cut it short, yeah. um, shorter than I would like. Let's put it that way. And um, we are really looking forward to seeing you next week. I want to thank you for your contributions here today. And, yeah. Um, well, thanks, John. Thanks for the opportunity, man. Yeah. Glad to have you on. Thank you.